applause for that introduction. I love young people who are doing science. And I especially love seeing young women in sciences. And so A couple other people I want to mention. Uh, your mayor, Mayor Peter, is here. Flew where is he? Where is he? There he is. Flew back with me on Air Force One. Uh, he didn't break anything. It was amazing though, when we were uh, coming back, he was telling me the story about his grandfather, an immigrant from the Basque region coming here and how he would herd sheep and, and for five years he would, he'd be up in the mountains and the hills and then come down to town for like two months, a year, the rest of the time he was up there. I figured his dad was a pretty tough guy. Because I bet it gets kind of cold up in the hills. Uh, another person I want to mention, this is somebody who I actually have known for a really long time. He was a lieutenant governor in Illinois. Now is your outstanding president here at Boise State. President Custer. Yeah. It's good to see Illinoisans do something with their lives. Yeah. I'm proud of them. Uh, thanks to all the Broncos for having me. So, last night I gave my State of the Union address. Today I'm going to be short. I won't be too short, just a little short. And, and I focused last night on what we can do together to make sure middle class economics helps more Americans get ahead in the new economy. And, and I said that I'd take these ideas across the country. And I wanted my first stop to be right here in Boise, Idaho. Now, there are a couple of reasons for this. I know, mine too. The first is because last year, Michelle and I got a very polite letter from a young girl named Bella Williams, who is here today. Where's Bella? There she is right there. Wave, Bella. <laughs> Bella's 13 now, but she was 12 at the time. So she wrote me a letter and she said, I know what you're thinking. Wow, what's it like in Boise, Idaho? <laughs> so she invited me to come visit. And she also invited me to learn how to ski or snowboard with her. <laughs> now, as somebody who was born in Hawaii, where there's not a lot of snow, um, let me put it this way, you do not want to see me ski. <laughs> or at least the Secret Service does not want to see me ski. <laughs> uh, but what I do know about Boise is that it's beautiful. I know that because I had been here before. I campaigned here in 2008. Because of the incredible work that was done here in Idaho, it, it helped us win the primary. And, you know, I might not be president if it weren't for the good people. Woo! Of course, in the general election, I got whooped. <laughs> I got whooped twice, in fact. Uh, but that's okay. I've got no hard feelings. Got you. In fact, that's. That's exactly why I came back. Because I ended my speech last night with something that I talked about in Boston just over a decade ago. And that there is not a liberal America or conservative America, but a United States of America. And to, today I know it can seem like our politics are more divided than ever. Place like Idaho, the only blue term.
surf is on your feet. Woo! Yeah! That's kind of funny. Let's go, Brad, go! <laughs> and the pundits of Washington hold up th these divisions in our existing politics, and they show, well, this is proof that any kind of hopeful politics, that's just naive. But as I told you last night, I, I still believe what I said back then. I still believe that as Americans, we have more in common than not. You know, we, I mean, we have an entire industry that's designed to sort us out. Right? Our, our media is all segmented now, so that instead of just watching you know, three stations, we got 600. And it, you know, everything's market segmented, and, and you got the, the conservative station and the liberal stations. So, Everybody's only listening to what they already agree with. And then you've got political gerrymandering that sorts things out so that every district is either one thing or the other. And, and so there are a lot of institutional forces that make it seem like we have nothing in common. One of the great things about being president is you travel all across the country, and I've seen too much of the good and generous and big-hearted optimism of people, young and old, folks like Bella. I've seen how deep down there's just a core decency and desire to make progress together among the American people.
We believed we could do better when it came to educating our kids for a competitive world. And today our younger students have earned the highest math and reading scores on record. Our high school graduation rate has hit an all-time high. More young people, like folks right here at Boise State, are finishing college than ever before. We figured sensible regulations could encourage fair competition and shield families from rule and prevent the kind of crises that we saw in 2007, 2008. And today we have new tools to stop taxpayer-funded bailouts. And in the past year alone, about 10 million uninsured Americans finally gained the security of health coverage, including right here. Sometimes, you know, you think folks have short memories because at every step of the way we were told that these goals were too misguided or they were too ambitious or they'd crush jobs or they'd explode deficits or they'd destroy the economy. You remember those, right? Yeah. yeah. I bet that every step we took, that, oh, that's, this is going to be terrible. And instead, we've seen the fastest economic growth in over a decade. And we've seen the deficits, as I said, go down by two-thirds. And people's 401ks are stronger now because the stock market has doubled. Woo! And healthcare inflation is at the lowest rate in 50 years. Yeah! Make sure that 
folks keep earning higher wages down the road. And that means we've got to do more to help Americans upgrade their skills. And that's what all of you are doing right here at Boise State. You know, you heard, you heard Camille's story. She's a mechanical engineering major. She's a great example of why we're encouraging more women and more minorities to study in high-paying fields that traditionally they haven't always participated in, in math and science. job experience with industry partners. She's the leader of your microgravity team. <laughs> and, and by the way, she's a sophomore. So by the time she's done, she might have she might have invented time travel by the time <laughs> she, she's done her voice. But the point is, I want every American to have the kinds of chances that Camille has. Because when we've got everybody on the field, that, that, that's when you win games. Think about if, if we had as many young girls focused and aspiring to be scientists and astronauts and engineers. You know, that, that, that's, that's a, a whole slew of talent that we want to make sure is on the field. Seeing progress and it's contributing to the economic development 
of the city and the state as well as being good for the students. And that's why my administration is connected community colleges with local employers to train workers to fill high paying jobs like coding or robotics as well as traditional fields like nursing. And today we're partnering with business across the country to upskill America, to help workers of all ages earn a shot at better, higher paying jobs, even if they don't have a higher education. We want to recruit more companies to help provide apprenticeships and other pathways so that people can upgrade their skills. We've, we're all going to have to do that in this new economy. But it's hard to do it on your own, especially if you're already working and supporting a family. Now, as we better train our workers, we need the new economy to keep churning out high-wage jobs for those workers to fill. And that's why the third part of middle-class economics is about building the most competitive economy in the world. We want good jobs being created right here in the United States of America, not someplace else.
think when you talk to them privately, uh, you know, when they're not on camera, uh, you know, they generally agree that it's important. You know, educating our young people, creating good jobs, being competitive, those things shouldn't be controversial. But where too often we run onto the rocks, where, where the, the debate starts getting difficult, is how do we pay for these investments? Because it requires dollars. I mean, the, the, the labs here and, and the infrastructure that we need, you know, those things don't just pop up for free. And the private sector, which is the heartbeat of our economy, it, it, it doesn't build roads, it, it doesn't create ports, it doesn't lay down all the internet lines that, uh, or the broadband lines that are required to reach remote communities. So we have to make some investments. We've got to figure out how to pay. And as Americans, we don't mind paying our fair share of taxes as long as everybody else does. Some corporations paying nothing while others are paying full freight. Yeah. You, you've, got, you've got the super rich getting giveaways they don't need, and middle class families not getting the breaks that they do need. So, what I said last night to Congress, what I said last night to Congress is we need to make these investments. We need to help families. We need to build middle class economics. And here's how we can pay for it. Let's close those loopholes. Let's stop rewarding companies that keep profits abroad. Let's reward companies that are investing here in America.
My job is to put forward what I think is best for America. The job of Congress then is to put forward alternative ideas, but they've got to be specific. It can't just be no. I, I, I just, I'm not going to start a conversation. Tell me how we're going to do the things that need to be done. Tell me how we get to yes. I want to get to yes. Red states and blue states, we are still the United States of America. 